Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. We're almost through module three, so we're almost done talking about all of the Cerician dinosaurs. Uh, we've talked about all of the theropods that eventually lead to uh, T-Rex and to birds. Uh, we're going to start talking about the other branch, the Sauropoda, today, but we're going to start with the Sauropoda morpha, the kind of almost sauropods, the earlier basal forms, uh, just as we started with kind of the basal theropods that were similar, but a little bit transitional. Uh, and then we're going to get into next time, next class, the highly derived, uh, massive sauropod dinosaurs that we generally think of when we think of sauropods. But before we get into it, uh, some announcements. All right, so that's the announcements. Uh, let's review what we talked about last time. So last time we talked about the Manoraptora, which is this group of theropod dinosaurs that ultimately uh, leads to the avian dinosaurs, the, the birds. So what is the significance of the semi-lunate, the half-moon wrist that we start seeing in the Silurosaurs and particularly in the Manoraptora? So take a look at those options there. What do you think? All right. So that semi-lunate half-moon wrist bone, so our wrist bends like this. Uh, their wrists bend kind of in and out of the plane, kind of more like this, so much so that the pinky actually starts pointing backwards, uh, or at least it can start pointing backwards towards the elbow. Again, I can't do it because I don't want to break my wrist for you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, this semi-lunate wrist definitely does not restrict wrist movement. It increases wrist movement. Uh, it does not support uh, quadrupedalism. Uh, in fact, it would kind of lend more towards bipedalism. The front limbs become less efficient for walking. The hands and the fingers are no longer available to act as front limbs for walking. They become kind of more wing-like, and that's the answer. It makes the arms more wing-like. Uh, and it does not increase skeleton weight. It doesn't really have any impact on skeleton weight. Uh, what does reduce the skeleton weight is the kind of pneumatization, those air sacs in the bones. Uh, remember when we say hollow bones or hollow tail like the Silurosaurs, it doesn't mean that the bones are entirely open. They have this grid work of bone uh, in, inside with open air pockets between. Uh, that means that they're light, but they're still strong. They're still rigid and they're still able to support the animal. Uh, not as well as solid bone, but the trade-off is that they're much, much lighter and not quite as strong, but still strong enough, obviously, or else they wouldn't work and those animals would have died and we wouldn't find them in the fossil record because they would have gone extinct quite rapidly. Uh, so uh, another one, so we talked about the transition to birds. So uh, in Archaeopteryx, which is often considered uh, the first bird, uh, which of the following traits is not a derived bird-like trait that is found in that fossil? So what are some, what is some of the kind of more primitive uh, dinosaurian or reptilian traits that are seen in Archaeopteryx? So take a look at those options there. And the answer is uh, the clawed hands. So you can see here on the manual digits, uh, the fingers, if you will, they're actually now basically wings, uh, they still retain the claws on the digits. That's something that modern birds don't have. Uh, they have very sharp, in some cases, talons on their feet, but not on the hands. Uh, and they also have a toothed jaw. So modern birds have toothless beaks, uh, still very sharp and very good at eating meat, but they don't have teeth. They have pointy sharp beaks. Uh, some are blunt for seeds and nuts and things like that, but um, they don't have teeth. Uh, asymmetric pinnate feathers is definitely a thing that we see in a lot of birds. That's what allows them to fly. The asymmetry of the feathers is very important. The furcula, the wishbone, uh, you probably remember this from Thanksgiving. It kind of anchors in the breastbone there. Uh, you pull it apart, make a wish. Uh, that's a feature of birds and also a lot of theropod dinosaurs. And we also start seeing reduced fingers. Uh, they're uh, not as pronounced and eventually in birds, they actually sort of start merging together as you kind of saw on the last slide there. Okay, so uh, here's the Sariskia cladogram that we saw quite a while ago. Uh, here's Dinosauria. Remember there is the two big groups here, Sariskia, which we talked about for this whole module. 
and the Ornithia, which we're going to talk about next module. Uh, so we haven't talked about these yet. We will, though. Uh, the quote-unquote bird-hipped dinosaurs. These Saurischians are the quote-unquote lizard-hipped dinosaurs. Uh, confusingly, remember we walked up through these basal theropods, the early forms, uh, and then we started talking about the theropods themselves, that there's the Tyrannosauroid branch that culminates at the very end in Tyrannosaurus rex, so that kind of increase in size, decrease in forelimbs, uh, increase in brain size, and just this trend towards these uh, more and more efficient, more and more deadly carnivores over time. Uh, and then there's kind of the other branch that eventually leads to the birds, where we actually see a little bit of the opposite, where the body size sort of decreases over time, the weight in, uh, decreases over time to become more uh, flight worthy, although obviously remember that evolution doesn't have like goals in mind. Uh, it was just uh, beneficial for them to be smaller and lighter and faster and more agile with eventually feathers on the limbs, not initially for flight, initially for gliding or jumping or brooding or some of the other things that they would be helpful for. Uh, eventually they're used for flight uh, and so we actually see sort of elongating of the forelimbs. So that's again, kind of the opposite trend that we saw in the Tyrannosauroidea. Uh, so we've talked about the theropod. Now we're gonna start talking about the sauropoda morpha. And so we're gonna start talking about these basal transitional forms today. Uh, and next class, we're gonna talk about the true sauropods, the ones that we think about when we think about sauropod dinosaurs, the big uh, thunder lizards, the, the big massive herbivores. Uh, big quadrupedal herbivores, but what we see is that the sauropods come from uh, this group that the other dinosaurs come from, that initially they're bipedal and initially they're carnivorous, and so to get to these quadrupedal herbivorous forms, uh, it's quite the transition, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with the sauropodomorpha, and this includes all of the lizard foot forms. That's what sauropod translates to. Pod is foot, soro is lizard, as we've seen with all the saurus names for the dinosaurs. Uh, this group includes all of the largest land mammals, land, I said land animals, not mammals, they're not mammals, uh, ever to exist. So think about modern animals. Uh, the largest land animal now is the uh, elephant. Uh, these things dwarf elephants. These are absolutely massive creatures. Yeah. Uh, and what we're going to see over time here in the sauropodomorpha, particularly in the ones that we visit today, we're going to see a transition from really the carnivorous or omnivorous basal ancestors of all of the dinosaurs, uh, and then becoming kind of more and more specialized towards herbivory and kind of this general trend of getting larger and larger and larger, getting longer and longer next, moving away from the bipedal, two-footed walking ancestor uh, towards uh, facultative bipedal, which means that they will occasionally be bipedal, uh, or they'll mostly be bipedal, but they can walk on all fours, uh, to finally at the end, the massive sauropod dinosaurs where they are obligate quadrupeds. They, are, they have to walk on all fours, uh, they cannot walk on their hind limbs. Uh, it's just not physically possible. They're just too massive. They would crush their entire body weights designed to be on four limbs. If they put it up on two limbs, uh, they would probably crush. Although there is some debate about whether they'd be capable of doing uh, something like this, where they would kind of rear up to make themselves a little bit larger. Uh, that would be putting all their weight on the hind limbs and probably not possible in the largest forms. Uh, but maybe in some of the smaller, earlier sauropods, uh, and definitely in the sauropoda morpha that we're going to talk about today. Uh, so this is just kind of the diversity, uh, nowhere near as diverse in form as the theropods that we've seen, uh, kind of this general basic body plan. But we do see some changes over time, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with, um, this is the sauropod, sauropoda cladogram. We're going to start down here with the basal sauropodomorphs, and then we're going to work our way up through to the core prosauropods, the kind of almost sauropods. Uh, in the next class, we're going to talk about this group here, the true sauropods, the massive herbivorous quadrupedal 
dinosaurs that we think of when we think of sauropod. So let's start in with uh, this basal member here, Panphagia, and then we'll kind of walk up here and then we'll get into these others. Uh, so Panphagia, it translates to all eater. So like Pangea was all earth, all land, all continents. Panphagia, pan is all, and phagia is eat. So remember uh, Sorophaginax ate lizards, uh, other dinosaurs. Uh, Panphagia is all eater. Uh, it's named that from its uh, omnivorous diet, or at least that's the idea. And it's from the very late Triassic of Argentina. And so remember that the common ancestor of all dinosaurs was a carnivorous bipedal uh, archosaur. Sometimes they were originally called ecodont, which means socketed tooth. Uh, all dinosaurs come from this carnivorous bipedal archosaur ancestor. And what we're going to see in this group is that trend away from that, a trend away from all of those things, a trend away from carnivory, a trend away from bipedal a differentiation of their teeth towards herbivory and away from kind of this basal primitive condition that was inherited from their archosaur ancestor. Uh, so Panphagia retains some of those ancestral traits. Uh, it is bipedal. It's relatively small body size. Uh, it walks upright. It has these uh, leaf kind of shaped, these kind of broad leaf shaped teeth. Uh, and you see the serrations on there. Uh, these are a little bit different than the kind of dagger-like, knife-like serrated teeth of the theropods or the carcarodonts, the shark tooth dinosaurs. Uh, these are for omnivory, so they can eat smaller animals. Uh, probably able to eat insects uh, and able to eat plants if they want to. So they're kind of generalists where they'll basically uh, eat anything that they happen upon, which is a pretty successful strategy uh, in the wake of the Permian mass extinction. Uh, life is still sort of trying to rebound from that. And remember also at this time that the dinosaurs are not alone yet. Uh, there's still those big old Rawasukians prowling around, the Adasaurs, uh, those crocodilomorphs are larger and they're more robust and they're more common. And so the little, the dinosaurs, the initial dinosaurs, remember they maintain this kind of small-ish size and they're filling kind of the peripheral niches that those crocodilomorphs, the pseudosuchians, are not filling. And so omnivory is a great strategy. Uh, they're able to take advantage of whatever opportunities come their way and they don't have to try to compete directly with those more specialized, more adapted uh, crocodilomorphs like the Rawasukians and the Adasaurs and the Phytosaurs and all those other things. Uh, so that's Panphagia. Uh, Eoraptor, uh, so it's a little bit weird to be talking about a sauropod or a sauropodomorph uh, with raptor as the suffix. So remember raptor is like thief or to grab or to, to seize. Uh, Eo is usually like early or dawn, so this is dawn Caesar, and it's kind of, again, it's a kind of unusual name for a sauropod because when it was originally named, it was thought to be a theropod. Uh, so when you look at the teeth, uh, again, this is a transition from this basal carnivorous archosaur ancestor of all dinosaurs. Uh, Eoraptor is fairly close to this basal transition, and so it retains a lot of those carnivorous adaptations. Uh, one adaptation that it retains is that kink between the premaxillary, the front part of the jaw, and the maxillary, the back part of the jaw, like we saw in Coelophysids and in Dilophosaurus, the early theropods that kind of niche in the upper jaw, kind of like for grabbing and seizing prey. Uh, Eoraptor still has that, which means that it does probably eat uh, at least a little bit of meat. It's at least somewhat carnivorous, uh, but it has heterodont teeth. So hetero means different and dont means tooth. And so it has different teeth. So what do we mean by different teeth? Well, if you look at your mouth, uh, you have different types of teeth. So we got the front teeth that are a little bit more broader and flatter. We got the canines that are a little pointier and we got the molars that are more for like crushing and grinding. And so humans are heterodonts. Uh, mammals tend to be heterodonts with different teeth suited for different purposes. 
uh, Eoraptor has that, which means that it's probably eating a lot of different things. So it has those serrated recurved teeth, like the carnivorous dinosaurs, the later theropods, and the earlier archosaur. Uh, but it also has some of the leafier teeth, those broader teeth with the serrated edges that are probably lending towards herbivory. And again, we see this pretty small body size, uh, kind of chicken size, maybe a little bit larger to maybe like turkey size. Uh, probably eating some animals that it happens upon, but in this particular environment at this particular time, the early dinosaurs are competing with a lot of other large creatures. Uh, we see these very large kind of don herbivorous uh, synapsids. Uh, here's a Rawasuki in here, a very large carnivorous crocodilomorph. We see the uh, uh, adasaurs, the large herbivorous, uh, crocodilomorphs. Uh, we see some even larger amphibians that are filling some of these niches. Uh, the dinosaur is here. Eoraptor is relatively small, built for speed, built for running away, built for filling whatever role these larger forms are not. Uh, we see here also in this formation at this time we have a very early basal theropod, Harerosaurus, which we talked about when we talked about the basal cerisgians, the basal theropods. Uh, some of the carnivorous dinosaurs are starting to get large err, uh, but they're still living in the shadow of these more advanced, more derived uh, crocodilomorphs. Uh, moving along to Saturnalia, uh, Saturnalia might be a word you've heard before. It's this uh, Roman festival that celebrates the god Saturn. Uh, eventually, it allegedly transitions into the season that we now know of as Christmas. Um, it was named for the festival season uh, during which it, it was discovered. So this dinosaur Saturnalia was discovered during Saturnalia in the late Triassic period, in less, late Triassic rocks of Brazil. Uh, and again, this is a basal sauropodomorph, a lot closer to the archosaur ancestor of all dinosaurs than it is to the more derived, more advanced uh, or fully herbivorous, fully quadrupedal sauropod dinosaurs. And so again, it shows a mixture of these traits. It shows some theropod carnivorous traits, and it shows some sauropod traits sort of trending towards herbivory, uh, just as you'd expect from something that's transitional. It shows a lot of features of both. It's a mix of both because it's kind of caught in between. Uh, so it still shows some of the blade-like teeth that we come to associate with the carnivorous theropods. Uh, but again, it also has some of those herbivorous teeth. And again, leads to the assumption that it's probably an omnivore. And you see here in the body size, uh, here's a house cat for scale, getting a little bit bigger, but still not something that you would call large. Uh, although we're, it's the, you see this increase in body size. Uh, and the Thecodontosaurus is another example of one of these basal omnivore sauropodomorphs uh, from the late Triassic of England. So these things are in Europe as well. Uh, this is one of the first dinosaurs that was, was discovered. Uh, and it was discovered in uh, Durham Down Quarry in 1834. So when Richard Owen named Dinosauria in 1842, uh, this Thecodontosaurus was known and the material was around but uh, it wasn't one of the original three dinosaurs. So remember, uh, Megalosaurus, Iguanodon, and Hylaeosaurus were the three that he grouped in there. Uh, in the subsequent years, more and more dinosaurs were added, and eventually Thecodontosaurus was one of them, but it wasn't originally. Uh, he didn't recognize it as a dinosaur. Uh, so this is, again, what we see here, uh, maybe a little bit larger, but still relatively small. Uh, one cool thing about this is that uh, they, there actually is a relatively complete, uh, very well-preserved skull of Thecodontosaurus that was actually CAT scanned, uh, and it got, gave a very good image of the brain case. And when we talk about physiology and senses in the last module, remember the only real insight that we have into uh, dinosaur vision, dinosaur smell, dinosaur hearing, dinosaur even like orientation, uh, their stance, uh, there's a lot of skeletal evidence for that too, but definitively with the ear canal here you can you can tell the orientation of their skull in their resting position. 
Uh, but the only way to really get insights into those senses is to look at the structure of the brain and the relative sizes of the different parts. So remember like Tyrannosaurus had that really well-developed olfactory bulb, uh, very good at smell, uh, the large kind of softball sized eyes with a pretty good developed optical area of the brain uh, with binocular front facing vision, uh, pretty good at sight as well. Uh, this is an opportunity to analyze this particular dinosaur by looking at the, the endocast, the uh, internal structure of the brain case and provide some insights into some of the more basal dinosaurs. Uh, you see here it's depicted as sort of uh, a little bit more quadrupedal. Uh, that's probably not the case. It was probably mostly bipedal, uh, but you see the front limbs are long enough that it could definitely walk on all fours uh, if it wanted to, and it probably did from time to time. And it's shown here kind of eating grass, uh, but it was probably kind of a little bit more omnivorous and it would probably eat uh, basically anything that it came across, any opportunity that it could. Uh, and the last of these most basal sauropodomorphs that we're gonna talk about is Aphrasia, of Aphrasia, uh, named after uh, E. Frost, uh, so the guy that discovered them. Uh, and they're known from the late Triassic of Germany. Uh, originally, he tried to name it Paleosaurus, uh, but that was already kind of in use, so it was a duplicate name. So later on, they had to rename it, and they renamed it in his honor, uh, even though I think he had already been dead by that point. Um, but now we see here's the size of Euphrasia, and it's much larger. Uh, this is a, a big, a big, a big animal. <laughs> Uh, certainly not as big as the dinosaurs that we're going to see later on, certainly not as big as some of the other theropods that we talked about, but it's big. Uh, it's still probably bipedal though, but you see that the front limbs probably are able to touch the ground. Uh, it's probably occasionally uh, quadrupedal, but it's still mostly bipedal, but we're getting larger, we're getting kind of longer forelimbs, at this point now, it's probably fully herbivorous. So looking at the dentition of this, uh, we've sort of started losing some of those basal primitive carnivorous traits that all of the dinosaurs inherited from their archosaur ancestor. This is the trend now towards full herbivory away from omnivory. This thing was eating plants uh, almost full time, uh, so much so that it might have actually developed uh, fleshy cheeks. Uh, that's not something that we see in the theropods. Uh, fleshy cheeks are an adaptation to kind of hold bits of food in the mouth. Uh, as you're constantly chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing, and it's something that's associated with uh, herbivory or omnivory, uh, not with carnivory. Carnivores just gulp down uh, big chunks of meat and kind of digest it. Meat's easier to break down in the digestive system, so you don't need to chew as much. Uh, and so like uh, modern birds of prey will gulp down big chunks. Uh, modern carnivorous mammals will again gulp down big chunks. Uh, you don't need kind of the fleshy cheeks. Uh, it also may have had a beak. So uh, a lot of the beaks are just keratin. So like the material that your fingernails are made out of and also your hair. Uh, it doesn't really hold up all that well, so it might have had a beak, but there's pretty poor evidence for that, uh, but possibly. But again, we see this trend, getting bigger, longer forelimbs. Uh, in this case, we actually have um, kind of elongate uh, nimble fingers with claws, probably for stripping vegetation off of these trees. Uh, this thing is probably capable of rearing, uh, like this other dinosaur that we'll talk about in a second. Uh, reaching up to the uh, high parts of the tree. Uh, so that's the basal uh, sauropodomorphs. Uh, and now we're going to move into this group here, these core prosauropods. Uh, so we're going to kind of walk up through these different uh, examples of core prosauropods. And again, next time we're going to talk about the fully, the, the more derived sauropods themselves. Uh, so core prosauropods, uh, sometimes referred to as just prosauropod, prosauropoda, or sometimes called near sauropods, uh, because they're nearly sauropods, but not quite. Uh, we're, we're, what we see with these examples 
is a continuation of that trend that we've already seen here, getting larger, getting longer necks, uh, more and more specialized in herbivory, more and more specialized to eating plants. Uh, core prosauropods really start coming on the scene during this event called the Carnian pluvial event. So pluvial is rain. So, and Carnian is a time period. So it's the Carnian rain event uh, where uh, it rained for millions of years. It was, it was a very hot, uh, well, not quite as hot. It was actually cooling a little bit. So remember at the beginning of the Triassic, at the very early parts of Triassic, Pangaea is assembled. We have this massive single continent. All of the land mass of the world is assembled in one supercontinent. The interior of that supercontinent is really far away from water. It's really dry and it's really arid. One of the things that caused the extinction at the end of the Permian was the shift towards much hotter temperatures. And so at the beginning of the Triassic, we have a very hot, very dry climate. And this is great for the crocodilomorphs and the lizard-like reptiles that survived through that event. Uh, they're very well adapted to that environment. Uh, what we see though, kind of nearing towards the end of the Triassic, uh, not quite to the end, uh, there is another event there that has massive impact, but uh, what we see here is that this Carnian pluvial event is really the start of, or, or I should say a continuation of this shift away from that hot arid climate. The climate is getting cooler, uh, certainly not cold, uh, it's getting cooler. Uh, the end of the Permian is probably the hottest that it's ever been in the history of the earth. Uh, it's a cooling down from there, uh, still warmer than it is today uh, by a fairly large margin, uh, but not as hot as it was, uh, and also not as dry as it was. Lots of rain during this period. It's a two to three million year long period where it's uh, massive amounts of rain. This is a very new kind of cycle of increased precipitation, increased humidity. And these prosauropods uh, really start blossoming in size and the pre-existing crocodilomorph herbivores like the adosaurs, uh, they are finally kind of pushed a little bit to the side. They're not as well adapted to this new climate as they were before. Uh, the large dicynodont herbivores, the synapsids, uh, that they're along the mammal line. Uh, they're, they're, they're not mammals, but uh, they're on that same line that eventually leads to us. Uh, though they were dominant and now they start to struggle. Uh, those forms on the slides before that we showed those large forms in the uh, Triassic there, they're starting to get outcompeted a little bit by these prosauropods. And these prosauropods are the first dinosaurs that actually dominate a major ecosystem uh, niche or role, job function on Earth. They start filling the large herbivore role and they sort of steal it away from those crocodilomorphs. This is the first time that dinosaurs are really no longer in the shadow of these uh, uh, crocodilomorphs. Uh, now they're able to establish themselves as dominant. Uh, the carnivorous dinosaurs uh, aren't quite there yet, but we start seeing this as well, where those carnivorous dinosaurs start competing directly with the Rauisuchians. Uh, and eventually at the end of the Triassic, they go extinct. Uh, and then there's a massive explosion in diversity of dinosaurs, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, this is kind of the precursor to that though. The climate's shifting a little bit and dinosaurs are starting to become more dominant in their environments and they're able to really steal uh, one of these major roles for the first time. Uh, and when we get into the Jurassic, they're gonna steal essentially all of the major niches on land uh, and eventually in the sky, uh, not in the water though. There are no aquatic dinosaurs, uh, potentially Spinosaurus dabbles in it, but it's not fully aquatic. Uh, it doesn't have gills or anything like that. Although a lot of the marine reptiles, none of the marine reptiles did that either. They all had to breathe. But uh, Spinosaurus is the only one that even probably went into the water a lot. So keep that in mind. 
All right, so let's talk about some of these core pro sauropods. Uh, there's a Rioja, Rioja lizard or Rioja lizard, uh, Riosaurus. Uh, it's named after the La Rioja province of Argentina in South America. And it's also late Triassic in age. And you see here again, uh, a little bit less competition from those adosaurs, a little bit less competition from those uh, dikinodont herbivores, the large herbivores. Uh, they're fading away a little bit. Uh, and so dinosaurs start getting bigger. They start getting longer necks. Uh, if we look at the hind limbs on here, remember that the very basal ancestor uh, was a very kind of nimble bipedal carnivore. Uh, dinosaurs, the basal theropods like these coelophysids here, kind of maintain that general body shape. Uh, we're starting to trend in, in this particular group towards something more like this. Uh, this isn't Riojasaurus. Uh, it's the next dinosaur we're going to talk about, but you see a lot of similar features. Uh, the hind limbs you see, uh, the ankle bones are getting a little bit less elongate. Uh, the legs are becoming built for power and support rather than for speed and quick running and pursuit. Uh, they're also becoming more dense. So the bone, the actual bone of the legs is becoming more robust and more dense. Uh, and that's uh, likely to support this uh, bipedal stance. There's a lot more weight now on this dinosaur. And if you're going to be walking around on two legs, those two legs have to be more stout or else they're going to crack under your own weight. And so as the body size gets bigger, you see this increase in the size of the gut. Uh, there's more neck hanging out over the front. Uh, the legs have to get bigger and bulkier too. We're getting this trend towards thicker, bulkier bodies. Uh, the base has to thicken in response. Uh, one thing that we see though is that uh, while the base, the legs, are getting thicker and broader and stronger, uh, the body is getting bigger, but the vertebrae, uh, most of the bone in the upper body, uh, that's actually getting light, lighter. So we're starting to see air pockets uh, in the vertebrae. The vertebrae are becoming lighter weight. And so we, that's a trend that we see in the larger sauropods, the legs, the base, gets kind of heavier and heavier and stouter and stouter to support the massive gut and the whole flesh and muscle of the dinosaur. Uh, but the upper portion of the body, the bones are actually getting lighter to kind of lessen that load on the limbs. The less skeletal weight you have, uh, the more gut weight you can have, the more neck weight you can have. Uh, and so there's kind of this trade-off between uh, being kind of bulkier and fleshier uh, they need to lighten the skeleton. They need to lighten their mass. Uh, you can't do it in the legs or else you're going to crumple and fall apart. Uh, so they start lightening the skeleton along the vertebrae to sort of allow for that load. Uh, another thing that's sort of interesting about Riosaurus is uh, if you look at the sclerotic ring, uh, those bony plates that are actually internal to the eye that really kind of make, help the eye hold its structure. Uh, one of the pieces of evidence that vision in dinosaurs was actually probably pretty good. Uh, modern birds have sclerotic rings and their vision is, is quite good. Uh, we also see this very large opening in the sclerotic ring, which is kind of like an aperture on a camera. The wider that is open, the more light it's gathering. Uh, and so these may have been uh, sort of uh, dawn to dusk, dawn or dusk predators, as opposed to like fully on in the daytime. Uh, we're still competing with some of those other uh, crocodilomorph organisms. And so this is a way of kind of niche partitioning. Uh, in addition to having the longer necks and being able to exploit things that are kind of higher up off the ground, uh, they're able to be active uh, during times when those organisms are not. So remember, dinosaurs are probably uh, mesothermic or possibly even endothermic. Uh, in the early morning hours, the late day hours, when it's a little cooler, a little less uh, sun energies around to warm up those ectothermic critters, those crocodilomorphs, so they're probably kind of slow and groggy. Uh, this thing's probably able to be active. And so it's another way of competing for the same resources in the environment. Uh, they're not doing it at the same time, 
Uh, and they're also not doing it at the same place because they're going for higher uh, fetches. So the, the niches, that role, that herbivorous role is kind of broken up into a bunch of categories. There's the daytime hunters or daytime feeders, the nighttime feeders, the sunset and uh, sunrise feeders. There's the low to the ground feeders, the middle to the ground feeders, the high tree feeders. And so there's a bunch of different roles. It's not just straight up herbivory. There's a lot of different little subsets and that kind of helps a lot of different organisms fill a lot of different roles and increases the diversity that we see. Uh, the dinosaur that you see behind me here is Platyosaurus, which translates to broad lizard. Uh, the, the actual uh, origin of the name is a little bit uh, uncertain, but it probably refers to like their broad build, their broad shoulders. Uh, it's a very sturdy build, uh, again from the late Triassic of Germany, and it's the largest dinosaur from the Triassic. It's the largest known dinosaur from the Triassic. Of all of the Triassic dinosaurs that we've talked about, all the Triassic dinosaurs that we will talk about, uh, this is the largest. Uh, and it's really not all that large. So here's a human for scale. Uh, certainly it's big, it's definitely big. Uh, it wouldn't look out of place in the modern world. Uh, it's, you know, it's about the size of an elephant, I would say. Uh, maybe a little bit more massive, possibly. But it's not absurdly large like the giant titanosaurs that we'll see later. Uh, so this is kind of where dinosaurs are at, at the end of the Triassic. Uh, they're still competing with all those crocodilomorphs, uh, with that Carnian pluvial event, with that increase in precipitation, uh, a little bit of cooling. Dinosaurs are starting to do a little bit better, but they're not there yet. Uh, but Platyosaurus is one of these first like truly big dinosaurs. Uh, one thing that's interesting is though, it, it was known uh, when Richard Owen uh, named Dinosauria, but he didn't add it in there yet. Um, so it wasn't one of the original three, but it was added quickly. So it was one of the, it's one of the earliest named dinosaurs and it's known from lots of very good, well-preserved material. Uh, its lifestyle was a little problematic at first because it has these long claws and it has kind of long pointy teeth, uh, maybe initially confused for carnivory, but uh, remember just like a lot of the other, um, the manoraptorins that we talked about, long claws doesn't always mean for gouging. It can be for digging, it can be for stripping leaves. Uh, so these long claws on the front limbs here are mostly for eating vegetation, stripping vegetation. Uh, and again, you can see like Platyosaurus, the largest Triassic dinosaur of all of them. Uh, here's a Coelophysis for comparison, uh, one of the basal theropod dinosaurs, one of the basal carnivorous meat-eating dinosaurs. Uh, you can see that they're not attaining this large size yet, but we know that story already. Uh, another one of these is uh, Massospondylus. So Massospondylus translates to longer vertebrae uh, and it's named that because we start seeing these uh, vertebrae, the cervical vertebrae, the neck vertebrae becoming elongated. Uh, if you look to the previous slides, uh, there's kind of more neck vertebrae uh, which makes a longer neck. Now we're starting to see them kind of stretch out too. Uh, and this is found in the early Jurassic of South Africa. So we've crossed that boundary uh, into the Jurassic we're past that end Triassic mass extinction where now the Rawasukians are extinct, the Adosaurs are extinct, the Dicynodont herbivores are extinct. Uh, those organisms are out of the way. And what again, we see this pattern where there's a mass extinction, the animals that were filling the primary roles are gone. Those jobs, those niches are open and the life that survives very quickly diversifies and fills those roles. And this is what we see the dinosaurs do. We already saw them taking advantage of a little bit of a lull as the climate shifted. Now those jobs are fully open, the, the competition's out of the way, and we really start seeing the diversity take off, and we really start seeing the size expand pretty rapidly. Uh, so Massospondylus starts this trend of the next becoming very elongate, uh, it does have these peg-like teeth that can somewhat be mistaken for carnivorous, uh, but they're really more designed for vegetation. Again, we see these long claws 
uh, really kind of vicious claws on the front limbs. Uh, and it was initially interpreted as, as a carnivore, uh, but it's not, it's an herbivore. And another piece of evidence for that is that it actually has palate teeth, uh, which are teeth that are on the roof of the mouth, which are associated with grinding and crushing of vegetation. Uh, it's so far the only dinosaur that we know of that has uh, palate teeth. Uh, and again, you see the size, uh, it's not massive, but it's getting bigger. Uh, Unanosaurus, uh, getting larger still, uh, named, it's Yunnan lizard, it's named from the Yunnan province of South Central China, where it's found uh, in the early to middle Jurassic rocks there. Uh, it's possibly a species of Massospondylus, which we talked about last slide. Uh, and what, again, what you see, this, the larger body size, uh, the stouter hind limbs are responding and they're larger and they're more robust to support all of the weight of the dinosaur. And so it's still probably mostly bipedal. It's still mostly walking on two legs, uh, but we do see that the front limbs are becoming a little bit longer. Uh, they probably set them down occasionally. Uh, they may do it actually maybe quite frequently, uh, but they're mostly bipedal still. Uh, again, they may be capable of rearing up into the tree to reach higher and higher things. That would put all of the weight on the rear limbs. Uh, since these things are bipedal, that's probably still okay. Uh, they're used to bearing the entire weight of the animal on just two limbs, and so they're capable of doing that. Uh, we also see in here kind of these spoon-shaped teeth uh, that actually kind of fit tightly against each other and they actually wear against each other and as they do that they kind of sharpen each other and so we're seeing these like very advanced herbivorous teeth that we see pretty frequently in later more derived sauropods. Uh, we've really made that transition from carnivorous archosaur ancestor to kind of omnivory dabbling in herbivory to now pretty highly specialized for herbivory in Unanosaurus. Uh, Lufangosaurus, uh, Lufang lizard is named from the city of Lufang, uh, which is actually in Yunnan province. Uh, and it's early Jurassic in age, uh, maybe another possible species of Massospondylus, so maybe the same thing. Again, we see this sharp teeth, sharp claws, uh, possibly omnivorous, but more likely it's fully herbivorous. Uh, the one cool thing about this dinosaur that's very special potentially is that uh, allegedly in 2017, there was a paper published that claimed to have extracted uh, collagen protein from the rib of an embryo of Lufangosaurus. And so this is something that's pretty important. Remember that in the fossilization process, the soft parts break down and uh, protein is something that degrades uh, fairly quickly. And so this revelation that there is intact collagen protein is kind of a step towards uh, intact, maybe genetic material. Ideally, uh, in theory, the longest that like DNA could survive is a couple million years. And so very unlikely to find that in dinosaurs, but we start seeing more and more evidence of proteins and things that would sort of start leading in that direction. We're starting to see more and more evidence of that. And so maybe that's not entirely true. Uh, so as technology increases, as the amount of fossils available increases, uh, it's likely that we're gonna kind of start seeing more and more of this type of thing. And uh, where it eventually leads, we can't say, but uh, we're starting to see more and more preserved organic soft material. And that's pretty exciting because it's something we didn't really have a glimpse at before. Uh, and the last one that we're going to talk about today, uh, Melanosaurus, kind of the a very advanced prosauropod. Uh, Melanosaurus, like melanin, means black uh, mountain lizard. Uh, so is named for this discovery on Black Mountain in the tr late Triassic of South Africa. And it has a very large, thick body with sturdy limbs. Uh, and the important thing here is that all four limbs are very sturdy. Uh, and you see very robust bones in the four limbs. Uh, this is indicative that these are now bearing weight. Uh, they're not just for stripping leaves. They're not for occasionally coming down on the ground. 
uh, these front limbs are modified to bear the weight of the animal or bear part of the weight of the animal. Uh, and so it was at least, mo at least somewhat to mostly quadrupedal and it may have been fully quadrupedal as we see uh, in the later sauropods. Uh, in fact, sometimes Melanosaurus is classified as a true sauropod. And if that's the case, it would be the earliest and only Triassic example of a true sauropod. So kind of depending on how you draw the line. So remember, uh, with cladistics and with taxonomy, uh, all of these categories that we're talking about, all of the trees that we've seen, they're all hypotheses. They're all human imposed bins to sort of help group things together. Uh, I hope you've seen through the course of this class how helpful that is to sort of try to draw these artificial bins and lump things together. It helps us see a lot of the similarities and it helps us see a lot of the differences and it helps us see how things have evolved through time and changed through time when we look at it systematically and when we look at it as a tree instead of just looking at, oh, look at this dinosaur, oh, look at this dinosaur, oh, look at this dinosaur, oh, look at this dinosaur. When we put them together and sort of start trying to group them, uh, first of all, we have to think about what might be important for grouping them. We have to think about what is capable of being used to group them together. Uh, and then we're even actually able to make predictions about like, okay, well, at this part of the tree, we see this, at this part of the tree, we see this, the things in between, we should see that too. So like, for example, feathers, we don't have a lot of feathers from a lot of different dinosaurs, but if we have evidence of feathers at a lot of different places on the tree, it helps us make inferences, it helps us make educated guesses. Uh, and so uh, that's why we draw these groups, but it is hard to draw these lines. And so it isn't definitive as to whether Melanosaurus is a prosauropod or a sauropod, because really the category is probably like a slow transitional spectrum change. And when you have these basal transitional members, it's really hard to figure out, like, does it belong in this group? Does it belong in that group? Where do we draw the line? Uh, so here's Melanosaurus, uh, very much resembling the more derived advanced sauropods that come next. And so just to kind of overview here where we've been. So again, if we look at dinosaurs of the Triassic, uh, Platyosaurus is the largest Triassic dinosaur. And we see Hererosaurus, one of the larger carnivorous Triassic dinosaurs, uh, Coelophysis, one of the more common carnivorous uh, Triassic dinosaurs. Uh, we talked about Eoraptor, which is kind of bounced back and forth between the theropods and the sauropods uh, because it's one of these more transitional members, uh, relatively small. Uh, we're gonna see next class that we start transitioning up through uh, some, trans some these transitional forms that we talked about, like Melanosaurus aren't on here, but uh, we're going to get into the Jurassic and we're going to start getting into the big sauropods. And so you can see this trend from Platyosaurus uh, to Apatosaurus to Brachiosaurus, this increase in size to the tremendously large uh, sauropod dinosaurs. Uh, and we've already talked about a lot of these. Uh, by the end of the class, we'll have talked about all of these dinosaurs. So I showed this figure very early in the class and some of you were maybe overwhelmed, like, wow, that's a lot of dinosaurs. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of them, and by the time we're done, we'll have, you'll be experts on every single one of these guys. So uh, we've come a long way. So it's pretty cool uh, what we've done so far. I'm proud of what we've accomplished, and I hope you are too. And I will see you next time.